So I called this project marriage a uh, biblical exposition and just don't get thrown off by the fancy wording. Uh, it just means a comprehensive explanation of an idea and the idea here being marriage. So through this presentation, we'll touch on quite a few different topics such as the biblical definition of marriage, uh, gender, purpose, design, and why this all matters. And my hope for creating this project is that after watching it, whatever your worldview might be, that you can walk away way with just a better understanding of the biblical view of marriage, as well as a clearer understanding of why Christians believe and teach the things that they do about marriage. What is marriage as described by scripture? Well, point number one states marriage is the covenant union and sealing by God of a man and woman in a lifelong exclusive and monogamous relationship. I still don't get it. So to expand upon some of these terms for clarification, a covenant union is kind of like a legal binding. So think of it as a promise with legal obligations. This isn't something flippant like dating, but it involves a legally binding contract between two persons. And being sealed by God means the contract is of transcendent nature. It's a supernatural binding. It has supernatural implications as well. So optimally, it's supposed to be lifelong, meaning the contract doesn't end unless someone dies, and it's exclusive and monogamous. So that means the unique aspects of this relationship, such as physical intimacy, is limited to just these two persons. Uh, point number two, marriage was not invented by humans, but was created and instituted by God himself. So again, this touches on the supernatural element of a marriage and reveals that humans have no right really to change the rules that God has set in place regarding marriage. These are parameters set in place by an authority, a power, if you will, and an intelligence far beyond anything that we could fathom. So in other words, the ability for us as humans to change these transcendent principles regarding marriage are just completely and utterly out of our scope of authority. Access denied. And then point number three, in the beginning of the book of Genesis, God reveals his design and standard for this covenant relationship. Uh, here's some excerpts from Genesis. You see kind of God's design for marriage just really laid out here. It says, um, then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs or part of his side in the Hebrew and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. The man said, now at last from my bones and my flesh, she shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Just kind of note the key elements in these passages. Uh, number one, God created humans and as creator has a authority over them. Remember we talked about that kind of transcendent nature of God. Uh, he is beyond the limitations of the material realm, beyond the reality we know as time, space, and matter. The results of which could cause a chain reaction that would unravel the very fabric of the space-time continuum and destroy the entire universe. He is an infinite and perfect being with perfect knowledge and understanding. And as a father has authority over his children, you know, a lot of us can relate to that. So he has authority over us as human beings. Number two, God wants humans to work and care for their environment. This is an important point. So God calls us to be stewards of our environment. 
That means we supervise, we watch over, and protect the creation around us in a biblical way according to God's parameters laid out further in Scripture. And uh, number three, this one's very important for us to understand. So God created humans as a biologically distinct male and female counterparts. So this is not a spectrum. His design is that humans are male and female biologically and socially. As you read through the scriptures, these concepts are laid out really plainly. Uh, are there people born with biological abnormalities where they have, you know, both male and female biological traits? Uh, yes, these people are called intersex, and it's actually an extremely rare condition. But these types of things should be expected from a biblical point of view. When mankind disobeyed God and rejected his authority... I don't need you or anybody else! I'm gonna make it on my own! sin and corruption entered the creation just as God promised it would. So this caused a breakdown of many aspects of our environment, including biologically, such as diseases, abnormalities, deformities, as well as deficiencies in our mental faculties, such as some people feeling romantically attracted towards the same sex, or feeling they were born in the wrong body. The, bib the biblical view makes perfect sense when we look around at the world we experience every day. There's brokenness, pain, depression, anxiety, sickness. We live and exist in a world that's a living illustration of what happens when humanity rejects its creator and chooses to do things their own way. Number four, God created a man and woman to join together as partners. Each bring a unique set of attributes and traits to their relationship that complement one another, producing, again, a living illustration of God's intended design for humanity. This concept is highlighted historically in anthropological data. What if a man decides that his, his gender identity is, is woman? A woman has its own duty, and a man has its own duty, and a lady cannot do the duty of a man, and a man cannot do a duty of a woman. Uh, in general, men are taller, women are shorter. Men are less emotional, women are more emotional. Men have greater upper body strength, women have less upper body strength. Men are less nurturing, women are more nurturing. Men are more analytical, women are more intuitive. Men are more task-oriented, women are more relationship-oriented. For men, respect is a higher priority. For women, love is a higher priority. Men have a higher sex drive, women lower. Men are more taciturn, which means they don't talk as much. Uh, women are more vocally communicative. Um, men tend to gravitate towards leadership positions, women towards more yielding positions. So are there exceptions to these rules uh, within the categories? You know, absolutely. Uh, nonetheless, the overarching theme of differences is really apparent. God designed men and women with different traits that complement one another to create an optimized unit when brought together in marriage. And finally, number five, through this union, God can allow these couples to bear children together. So this is a unique natural process exclusive to a male and female that really reflects his life-giving power and his ultimate purpose for us. One of the most amazing aspects of life is that a man and woman can come together intimately in a very special and powerful way. And from that, a child is created. A unique human being is brought forth into our world, and out of all the endless ways God could have chosen for this to take place, he chose this way, not through two men or two women, uh, but through the bonding of a man and woman to bring new life into existence. A life that will be able to grow up and to learn and to experience their environment. So that's why scripture says God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. You may still wonder, why can't humans change God's standards for marriage? Why? What do you mean, why? Because you can't. Why? 
Well, this is because marriage is sacred. So Webster's Dictionary actually defines sacred as, quote, something that is dedicated or set apart for the service or worship of a deity, unquote. So we touched on this in the second slide where we talked about kind of that transcendent aspect of marriage. And we as mere human beings have no right to alter transcendent laws set in place by God. So when a man and woman come together to be sealed as husband and wife in the presence of God, it's considered a sacred union. So marriage is thus a form of worship that reflects our obedience to God's purpose and design. We are to worship God by his standards, right? Not our own. And because marriage is sacred, man has no authority to change its precepts. And to do so would be a flat out rejection of God's authority over us. Oh yeah, it's all coming together. Uh, marriage is also a living illustration of the relationship between Christ and the church, which is his followers. So notice what scripture states about marriage. It says, as the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. Okay, so that's Ephesians. Notice the act of marriage between a man and woman has really deep and meaningful connections to how God illustratively displays the relationship he has with his people through Christ. The marriage of a man and woman is a really a reflection and foreshadowing of Christ's marriage to his church, the bride. So changing God's standards for marriage is thus a distortion of his intended display of this relationship. It distorts what God is trying to teach and show us. So we don't want to twist that. Uh, we want to stick to his authority and learn what he wants to teach us. Uh, one thing I really enjoy doing is reading the Bible from the original Greek. And if you do this, you'll find love is given one word in the English, but actually four words in the Greek New Testament. So agape, which is a kind of universal, unconditional, sacrificial love. Storge, which is love of family. Philae, which is love of friends. And then finally eros, which is erotic, romantic love. The amazing thing is that marriage is the only relationship designed by God that pulls all four of these types of love together. By God's design, Eros love is exclusively reserved for one man and one woman in a monogamous lifelong marriage. In no other relationship is Eros love to be used. So just to recap, God's sacred design for marriage entails the following details. One man and one woman, the relationship is to be monogamous. You aren't sharing eros love with other people. Uh, you are not to be closely related, such as marrying a parent or an aunt or uncle, brother, sister. The relationship is to be lifelong and both parties should be committed to God's standards for marital conduct. And if you aren't, you'll end up being unequally yoked, which is, uh, will, will strain and damage the relationship ultimately. So any deviation from these standards is a deviation from God's design and purpose for us. And in scripture, this is called sin, which brings us to our next question. What is sin? Okay, this is so important for us to understand if we're going to understand marriage and God's purposes for us. And so sin is an old archery term, which means to miss the mark, literally. So it's a deviation from the intended target or standard we're called to follow as Christians. So God created everything with design and purpose and deviation from his design, purpose, or standards, that intended target is called called sin. You disgust me. How can you live with yourself? So what did Jesus teach about marriage? Well, Jesus claimed that he was God in human form and through his life and ministry, he revealed who God is and taught us about God's standards for our lives. Uh, when asked about marriage and divorce, it was in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus said this, Haven't you read the scriptures, Jesus replied? They record that from the beginning, God made them male and female. And he said, This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. 
Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. So notice that Jesus affirmed God's design and standards for marriage. He refers back to the Old Testament scriptures. He explains that marriage is to include one man and one woman united together in a lifelong covenant sealed by God. Now, in today's modern culture, uh, experiencing eros love with someone has been made sort of a quintessential life goal, right? We see it in music, in movies, television, art. It's almost presented as something you can't live without. And if you do, you're kind of missing out on life. But in many ways, it's presented in our current culture as our ultimate purpose. But I want you to know that according to scripture, experiencing Eros love is not our ultimate purpose. Yeah, I want you to listen to that again. Experiencing Eros love is not our ultimate purpose. So while experiencing Eros love within the bounds of a godly marriage can be a blessing, it's not our ultimate purpose here on earth. So many people throughout scripture never experienced Eros love during their life here on earth. This included the Apostle Paul and even Jesus Christ himself. Uh, in regards to marriage, Jesus stated this, Some are born as eunuchs. Some have been made eunuchs by others, and some chose not to marry for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let anyone accept this who can. And that's Matthew 19. So what is a eunuch? A eunuch was someone who was celibate, and Jesus outlines that some people are going to choose to live celibate lives for the sake of his kingdom, of God's kingdom, ultimately. Uh, this one is interesting, the case of for singleness. And it says, while an advocate for godly marriage, the Apostle Paul also shared the benefits of singleness in the book of Corinthians. And so this is a really powerful piece of scripture. It says this, I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. An unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work and thinking how to please him. But a married man has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. His interests are divided. In the same way, a woman who is no longer married or has never been married can be devoted to the Lord and holy in body and in spirit. But a married woman has to think about her earthly responsibilities and how to please her husband. I'm saying this for your benefit. Okay, so listen to Paul very carefully here. This is for our benefit, uh, not to place restrictions on you. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best with as few distractions as possible. And so Paul really wants us to, for our own benefit, to serve the Lord because that's what's best for us, but ultimately it's best for God's kingdom and for his glory and purposes. So ultimately Paul's advice was that each Christian should choose to live their lives in a way that would most benefit God's kingdom according to his standards and purposes for our lives, right? Not ours. And we're to live in such a way that our highest goal is to die to our own passions and desires desires and instead live for God. This means living a life of repentance. And so did Jesus teach that we must turn from all sin in our lives? Well, Jesus taught that to enter the kingdom of God, everyone must repent, which just means to turn from their sins and turn to God. We must be willing to give up our own wants and desires to pursue God's standards for us, no matter what the cost. And anyone who refuses to do this will be cut off from God in eternity in a place Jesus called the Gehenna or, the, or hell. Jesus shares the following statements in scripture. This is Luke 5. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. Hey, Matthew 16, next. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you'll save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you yourself are lost or destroyed? If anyone is ashamed of me and my message, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in his glory and the glory of his Father and the holy angels. And then Matthew 12 is another great example. Uh, it says, The people 
people of Nineveh will also stand up against this generation on Judgment Day and condemn it, for they repented of their sins at the preaching of Jonah. Now someone greater than Jonah is here, but you refuse to repent. So uh, ultimately, we are handcrafted to flourish under God's design, under this design we're talking about. So why should we repent of our own way of doing things and abide by God's design and standards for us? Why? Well, number one, because humans are designed to operate optimally within God's intended purpose and standards for them. Our greatest purpose is to love God and serve him. And number two, listen to this interaction a teacher has with Jesus. So it says one of the teachers of religious law was standing there listening to the debate. He realized that Jesus had answered well. So he asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this, listen to know Israel. The Lord our God is the one and only Lord, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. That's Mark chapter 12. So some points to consider here. God has designed our reality in which when we love God most, we love others best. Okay, so that's worth repeating. When we love God most, we love others best. So ultimately, our goal, kind of the top of that pyramid for us in terms of things that are important is we want to love God most. And from there, the things that trickle down from that are going to benefit us uh, and ultimately benefit God's kingdom. Number two, loving God most involves obeying his commandments. So Jesus says, if you love me, obey my commandments and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He's the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. So that's John chapter 14. So we want to make sure that uh, we are obeying God because that shows in part um, our love for him and uh, for us to be obedient to him. Number three, we must repent of our own way of doing things and commit to do things God's way by obeying his commandments, like Jesus said. Uh, obedience to God is the key to unlocking our ultimate purpose and greatest satisfaction, which is reconciliation with God through Christ. I mean, that's the gospel. That's uh, why we're here. So uh, giving up everything for Christ, how did Jesus respond to people who were worried about giving up what they felt like was important? Okay, so there's a lot of things that are important to us in our lives that we are going to not want to give up uh, because we really enjoy them. Oh, I wish I could, but I don't want to. <laughs> Uh, whether it's a relationship with a certain person, whether it's addictions, whether it's hobbies, whether it's friends, family, our children. So notice Jesus's response to Peter. Peter said to him, we've given up everything to follow you. What will we get? And notice what Jesus says here. I assure you, that when the world is made new and the Son of Man sits upon his glorious throne, you who have been my followers will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has given up houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or property for my sake will receive a hundred times as much in return and will inherit eternal life. And so we have to be able to crucify our flesh and we have to be able to fight against it for God. Search your feelings, you know it to be true. No! No! Uh, and to be able to uh, just lay everything at Christ's feet and submit to him. Um, trust in God's design and purpose for you. So the Lord says in Psalm 32, I will guide you along the best pathway of your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a bit and bridle to keep it under control. Many sorrows come to the wicked, but unfailing love surrounds those who trust the Lord. So rejoice in the Lord and be glad all you who, what? Obey him. Shout for joy all you whose hearts are pure. So ultimately, God is saying here, listen, your flesh is going to want to do something um, against me and against my law, but ultimately, I will guide you along. You're the best pathway for your life. So the Lord wants what's best for us. 
And this video wouldn't be complete without explaining the gospel because that's what ties all of this together. Every single one of us is a sinner who falls short of God's standard for us. And all of us deserve to be punished for the sins we've committed in our lives. In God's perfect justice, he can't let the guilty go free. There's a fine that has to be paid. Oh, that is terrible news. But God loved us so much, instead of punishing us, he came down in Jesus, lived the perfect life we never could, and then took our punishment onto himself by being beaten and crucified, just as he had predicted. Then three days later, he rose from the grave to prove who he was, breaking the chains of sin and death. And now all we have to do is repent. Remember, that means to turn from your way of doing things and instead submit your life to God's standards. And then trusting alone in Jesus, surrendering your entire life to him, including your time, talents, money, family, even your own life. When you do this, God promises he'll send his Holy Spirit to live inside of you and over the course of your life, change you into a new creation, conforming you into the image of his son, Jesus, and also granting you eternal life, which is called being born again. And that's Christianity. That's the gospel. And Jesus says anyone who refuses to do this will be condemned. In the book of John, he says, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. So my question to you today is this. Have you been born again? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus and been given the gift of the Holy Spirit who will change you into a new person, giving you the desire to follow God's standards and turn from your old way of life? Today, even right now where you sit, you can turn to God and accept eternal life and be given endless living water only God can provide. So the conclusion here, um, ultimately follow the instruction manual. Uh, have you ever tried to build something without the instruction manual, right? So in our society today, we have millions of people trying to build their lives without the instruction manual and wonder why there's so much addiction, brokenness, pain, uh, yet God in his amazing love came in the world to save us. Um, and so 2 Corinthians chapter 19 says, For God was in Christ. It will say Theo in and Christo in the Greek. Um, God was literally dwelling in Jesus, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. So thank you everyone for watching this video. Um, whether you agree or not with Jesus' standards, I hope the information presented uh, at the very least helped you just get a better understanding of the Christian view on marriage and why it's important to follow his standards. Um, Jesus says if we love him, we'll obey his commandments. And it, an important aspect of following Jesus is obeying his commandments, even if it's hard or goes against how we feel uh, things should be. Christian life actually entails uh, really dying to our old wants and desires and striving to follow God's standards no matter what the cost. Um, just loving Jesus above everything else in our lives. And this may seem uh, extremely difficult to do, um, but what's important that we understand is that uh, when we surrender to God, believing that we're sinners and Jesus paid the price for our sins, God will give you the Holy Spirit to dwell inside of you and change you into a new creation to give you the strength and the desires inside of you to turn from your old ways and instead turn to God, receiving eternal life with Jesus forever. Uh, it's also important to understand too that people were made in God's image uh, and because of this, they are worthy of dignity and respect. So we are to love those who disagree with us. Uh, we don't name call or talk down to them uh, as though we're better than them. Um, we're all sinners in need of a savior. 
And so as Christians, we can love those around us and treat them with compassion and understanding, but at the same time, standing firm in God's commandments for us 